Uh, for this uh, very stimulating, uh, challenging, and also provocative uh, presentation. Now we collect some uh, questions in the list. Uh, the first one is uh, Professor Zamani, then uh, Orozco, yes, uh, then uh, McDonnell. Anybody else? Okay, so three people. We have only 15 minutes. Please, Stephen. Thank you very much, Hans, for your impressive presentation. I would be interested in knowing how would you react uh, to the, what is today called uh, an ethical dilemma. Now, uh, we know that in the year 2050, the global population will be 10 billion. In order to feed 10 billion mouths, as we say, agriculture should incre be increased by 40% with respect to today. On the other hand, uh, we know that 70% uh, of the results that you presented to us are due to agriculture, in particular to industrial agriculture, blah, blah. So the dilemma is the following, that if we want to feed everybody, we should increase production. But to increase production, we jeopardize even more the environment. So how do we, what the scientists that you represent here, the world of the scientists, they react to it. Because some people say, yes, we should uh, rescue the environment. But if to do that, we have to jeopardize the life of people, what's the, at the end of the day, it doesn't make a lot of difference. This is a dilemma which is uh, on the top of the agenda of not only of policy makers, but many different leaders. A second point, very specific, you have been talking about CO2 and that we why uh, uh, you didn't mention CF4, which is perhaps uh, even worse than CO2? Because uh, we know that CO2 can, we have a remedy for CO2, but there is no remedy at all for CF4. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, Professor Orozco, Marcelo. Thank you very much for a very sobering uh, presentation. I would like to commend you on where you end your discourse, and that is on the issue of children, education for sustainable development and for the environment. Because I think that this is at the center of an extraordinary opportunity. I concur with your intuition that the children enter the matter of the environment, uh, sustainable development, first with curiosity, which is the point of entry to all scientific endeavor, curiosity. This is beautifully captured by Newton, reflecting upon how it was curiosity that brought him into the scientific order. There are two additional domains that are central to the sensibilities of children and youth, qua the environment and sustainability. One is the intuitive ethical sense of children, that the top billion are now creating the catastrophic conditions for life for the bottom four billion people on Earth. So it's curiosity and science. It's the ethical intuition of the child about uh, justice. And the third domain that is so central here is the domain of agency, that children and youth can mobilize to correct the um, mistakes and the uh, needed corrections for moving forward. So it is really these three domains, agency, ethics, science, and curiosity. We are endeavoring now with your colleague, uh, Professor Ramanathan at the University of California, San Diego, and uh, Professor Mario Molina, uh, also both members of the Academy, winner of the Nobel Prize, also at the University of California, San Diego, uh, to with the support of the president of the University of California, Janet Napolitano, to initiate a statewide 
Education for Sustainability. And uh, Professor Pierre Lena, uh, also a member of uh, your academy, uh, has been um, a very significant point of reference. So thank you. Thank you for the science, thank you for the ethics, and thank you for understanding that it is the children that will lead the way. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, the last one, uh, Professor John McEldoni. John, please. Thank you very much, Professor, for a very clear exposition of the science and the policy implications. My question arises from what happened yesterday in the House of Commons. For the first time, a parliament passed uh, an emotion which proclaimed a climate emergency. And it follows on from the last questioner. The dimension of politics brings us into the question of how policy transfers and converges with policymakers. A five-year cycle of politics has to be dealt with in terms of what is doable and realizable. And my question is, please set us the priorities of advice that will take us through uh, the agenda you've set so eloquently. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very deep questions and, and, and actually also statements. Let me try to sort of satisfy uh, the needs uh, uh, expressed this way. So, Professor Tsamani, uh, first of all, yeah, the dilemma is real. You are absolutely right. Uh, because of the time lags and the inertia, we are on course of uh, 10 billion people on this planet. Um, there are two ways to respond to that. One is that uh, there we will have to do much more inquiries, research, practices, and so on, on climate smart agriculture. That's how it is called. Huh? There's a big program with the World Bank. We had very interesting uh, interventions, as I said, no tillage agriculture, for example, in Argentina and other places. Actually, it can be shown, but so far only in demonstrators, that you can have the same productivity, even higher productivity, with climate smart practices. So this needs to spread, of course. It is more costly in the beginning, so again, if you just leave it to the market forces, it will not work. Yeah? But if you have programs for it, and you might even add, actually, that if farmers are rewarded by sucking up carbon, you have carbon credit, so to speak, if you could combine that. There was a program in Australia for that, but it was, of course, abandoned by the current government and so on. So I think there are packages, there are systems of measures which could deal with that dilemma. But the second is, and that is also referring to your question, uh, I don't think it is a given that the world population will, raise to, will rise to 10 billion people. So we learned this in Germany after a reunification. The birth rate in Eastern Germany dropped by 70%. 7-0, this is probably the biggest uh, sort of cut in, in fertility rates uh, in, in the history, even during war times this didn't happen. It had to do with lifestyle change, of course. Huh? So I think education is the key, really. Yeah? If you look at the regions in the world where you still have a high fertility rate, uh, if you would be able to educate girls and young women and to give them their say in the social fabric, in the social makeup, uh, then I think we could reduce quickly fertility rates that would still bring us to eight billion people, probably eight and a half, but one or two billion difference is very important, actually. So, so these were, uh, what you said, uh, I cannot subscribe to every, I can only subscribe to everything you said, and you said it out very beautifully, yeah, but uh, it's, uh, it's curiosity, it's ethics, justice, and it's agency. Um, actually, it's interesting that uh, 
we have again Europe as the center uh, <laughs> sort of, uh, of, of its movement. In the United States it's not so strong actually so far, but in Sweden, in Germany, in France, all over Europe it is very strong. And the interesting thing is, that's why I use this metaphor of Shandarka, that uh, what these young people, I have taken part in some of these demonstrations actually, also with the Extinction Rebellion people in London, which is sort of borderline uh, for a scientist, but I think we have a strong case. And the interesting thing is, if, if you think of Greta Thunberg, for example, uh, she's a tiny, 16-year-old girl, uh, very fragile and so on. Uh, but she is speaking in a very determined way and she's using very simple words. Uh, but she's telling precisely the truth we have told for 30 years actually, but not in a technical way, in a way everybody can understand. This is probably what John Dark did uh, in 1415 or so on, Professor Dumont knows better about that than I do, clearly, yeah. But I've follow, always followed her story. It's a really amazing thing, yeah. And something like that. So it makes a difference whether Maria Callas is singing a song or a crow is singing a song. And we scientists are the crows of this world. Uh. But uh, finally, um, state of emergency in the House of Commons and so on. I also followed that. Uh, so what can be done about it? Um, I think conventional politics based on territorial nation states are not able to solve this problem. Of course, in Paris we had this agreement. It is a good compromise, but it is not delivered actually. It's just a, a nice target. Uh. So. When I had dinner with Angela Merkel just a few weeks ago, in the end, so it was a mixed group of people, including the, the head of the, uh, the Protestant church in Germany, Bertolt Sturm and so on. In the end, uh, he asked her, what can we do to help you to advance climate policy? Yeah? And she said, form unconventional alliances. Yeah? <laughs> And this is really, in a way, true because, as I said, I was a member of the German Coal Commission, which was a civil society group. Instead of formal politics driven by parties and so on, and winning majorities, blah, 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 it was a civil society group. We had the industries, we had the trade unions, we had young people, we had the, the local communities, and we had scientists on board. And in the end, in a 21-hour session, without a break, was the longest session I ever had, 21 hours. Yeah? We came up with a good compromise. Yeah? It's a little bit what the Irish did, you know, on these assemblies, uh, citizens' assemblies and so on. So maybe something new has to emerge in parallel to the conventional political system. Yeah? But civil society with the mandate from politics is self-organizing to overcome the big problems which cannot be solved in the traditional makeup. This is a, a story of hope, of course. I may be very naive. I'm not a social scientist, not a political scientist, but I was part of this process and it was successful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Schenhuber, for your passionate uh, and very expert intervention. Now we have the coffee break. And uh, uh, about 11.15, uh, there will be a bus outside uh, leaving to the Popol audience. Uh, so, see you later. Of course, if some people want to go walking, we can also. <laughs>